But this is definitely the definitive way to thin milk here. So, what do you think? Uh, it's definitely definitive. Thank you. I'm gonna start uploading this then. I am gonna go take a nap. All right. Just don't sleep for too long because we're gonna start recording in the morning, all right? Okay. All right. No, sister, don't sleep for too long. Joe, you ready to start? Joe. Hey, Joe. Ready to go? Joe? Joe. Joe, come on. Mm. Joe. Hey, Joe. Not the windows. Joe. When you think about it, dreams are a pretty weird phenomenon. While you're lying asleep for six to 10 hours every night, you're having very bizarre and vivid hallucinations ranging anywhere from being chased by fire breathing monsters to, I don't know, being late for work. And at the end of it all, you can barely remember any of it. It's hard to understand exactly what dreams are because our memories of them are so faint and fragile. And unfortunately, we don't have the tech to see where people are dreaming. So if you then go on to create a video game based on this concept, you can get some very interesting results. Some games like Bastion or Arkham Asylum might try to use dream sequences in their story, creating some interesting imagery, but otherwise not really exploring much. But other times, you get games that are about dreams, and then things get really cool. You can get fantastic adventures like Psychonauts or really weird games like LSD. And then there's Dreaming Sarah. It was released around March of 2015 by Asterisk the Game Studio. I don't think I'm gonna spoil anything by saying this is a game about a girl named Sarah who's in a dream. From the game's own description on Steam, she's in a coma and your goal is to find a way to wake her up. The game's about exploration. There are no enemies to fight, you just wake up in a strange dream world and allow to explore, solve puzzles, and find a way out. It's heavily inspired by games like LSD and Yumi Nikki. The atmosphere can only be described as haunting. From the environments, to the people you talk to, and the fantastic soundtrack of Anthony Septim. It's not a scary game by any means, and it's not like other atmosphere-driven games like Silent Hill, but this game is still very, very unique. And one of the main things I love about this game is that, to me, it really captures the essence of being in a dream, so much more so than any other game I've played. Of course, that's a bold statement, so I understand if you don't want to take my word for it. It's difficult to talk about dreaming, as we know so little about it. There is a lot of interesting research on the subject, though, and while I couldn't cover everything, there are a few concepts I think everybody should know to have a better understanding of dreaming. Okay, let's do this. Let's use Dreaming Sarah as an illustration to talk about some neuroscience behind dreaming. Cool, let's go. There's nothing actually there. I don't really know why I walked that direction. Let's just start. Rapid eye movement, or REM, is one of the only measures we have of sleep. It's the deepest stage and has some pretty easy to spot characteristics, like the aforementioned rapid eye movement. You reach REM periodically, usually 90 minutes after you fall asleep, and cycle in and out for varying periods of time. Now, a common belief is that this is the stage where dreaming occurs. This comes from experiments where researchers woke people up at various stages of sleep and asked them what they were dreaming. People can only recall dreaming anything when they woke up from REM. But actually, you likely dream throughout non-REM sleep as well. Though, maybe not as vividly. But what makes you sleep in the first place? There's no clear answer to what controls your sleep patterns or your dreams, but research published just last month found that neurons in the thalamus might be involved. The study was actually really cool. So they use optogenetic mice. These are mice that have been genetically modified so that the neurons respond to the light. This way they could use fiber optics to stimulate other neurons, you know, rather than just using regular metal electrodes, since when you put an electrode in your brain, you kind of destroy all the neurons that are in, around the contact and... You know what, let's just move on. There are three major changes that occur while you're asleep. The first is something you might have heard of, or maybe even experienced. It's called muscle atonia, or more commonly, sleep paralysis. This describes a phenomenon where you can't move and you can't speak. It's disorientating, and can be really freaky, especially since it usually happens after a nightmare. It is a real phenomenon though, and it happens to all of us, every night. When your brain enters the REM stage of sleep, all of your motor neurons are inhibited, preventing you from moving. The exact mechanism isn't known for sure, but the signal might be inhibited around the brainstem. Now, well that's fine and dandy, but I'm sure a big question you have is, why would this happen? Well, I want you to do something for me. I want you to imagine jogging down a street. Now, climbing a ladder. Now, swinging a baseball bat. As you imagine doing all these actions, those actions are essentially simulated in your brain. The motor neurons that are involved with carrying out those actions are activated. If there weren't further networks coordinating emotions that you intend to carry out versus those that you don't, you'd be doing all the motions you just imagined. And when you're in a vivid dream, if your brain didn't inhibit that signal before it got to your muscles, you'd be acting out in your sleep. The second biggest aspect of dreams is your lack of memory for them. Probably the biggest interest in dreaming besides why is what do we dream? 
That question's really hard to answer because we really don't remember much. And your poor dream recall is no accident. There are definitely some intentional changes going on that prevent memory functions. You see, your brain has all these different... Oh, okay, Kyle. Hey. I Welcome had this, back to the world of the living. I, I had this crazy dream. There was a, a freaking massive killer slug, and it ate only the windows of my house. And are you are you recording without me? Yeah, you've been asleep for months. No, 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 I yeah. haven't. Yes, yeah. Okay, it's, it's fine. I'm just starting on the memory section. Do you want to do this? Want to pick it up? Mm, yeah, yeah. Just, just give me a sec. Oh. Okay, I got this. All right, so memory is a pretty complicated phenomenon, but one of the major things we do know is that an area called the hippocampus is involved in forming new memories. So it doesn't store memories per se. There is no concrete area where memory lives, but the short story is that memories exist in the same networks of neurons that were originally involved in perceiving the event. So when something is transferred into long-term memory, what physically happens is the neurons that fire in your perception areas like vision or audition link together a network of neurons. When you remember the event, you're reactivating the whole network. The hippocampus is major in forming those connections. When it's removed or damaged, you lose the ability to form new memories. What's also interesting is that what your brain looks like when you're dreaming looks very similar to when you're remembering or imagining something. But there are definitely some strange happenings when you're asleep. From single cell recordings from rats, we know that the outflow of information from the hippocampus is blocked during REM sleep. Signal goes in, does not come out. And so, this disconnection makes it really difficult for you to form long-term memories of what you dream. Although I do believe dreams pull from memories in some capacity. Your dreams are created by your brain. All the neurons that are normally being used to perceive the world are firing sporadically, noisily, even without any sensory input. By consequence, this activates those memory networks, bringing bits and pieces of your memories into the dream. There is definitely a lot of top-down interpretation going on as your brain tries to make sense of the information. It's what your brain likes to do, you know, fill in the blanks, connect the dots. It takes everything and tries to make sense of it, and what you get is a dream. A strange mishmash of memories, thoughts, and ideas. I mean, this world that Sarah's in, it's random, but it's not nonsensical. There are basic rules. Gravity applies, there are floors, water, ladders, walls. It's based on our understanding of the world. And while these places and people might not directly exist, a lot of what you see as you explore the game likely pulls from our life. The spooky mansion you explore could be your childhood home. The ghost looks like a working dad, there are pictures of Sarah hanging around, and there's certain uh, imagery that suggests that she's familiar with the place. I really don't want to spoil this game. But the way I felt as I went from place to place was like I was experiencing bits and pieces of memory scattered between different constructs of places and ideas, which is very close to what dreams consist of. There's one last point we want to make. When you're perceiving things normally, there's a lot of influence from higher order functions from the prefrontal cortex, and it's worth exploring what happens there during sleep. All of your working memory, critical thinking, and decision making is coordinated in the frontal cortex of your brain. It's a hugely complicated region and one of the main features of the human brain that makes it unique. But there's definitely something different going on when you're asleep. If you can think back on some dreams you've had, I'm sure you can think of instances where things didn't make any sense or were blatantly wrong, but you just rolled with it anyways. Say you're talking with your mother, but they look and sound like a completely different person. Yet still you understood and believed them to be your mother. How does that error even happen? There's a lot being disconnected when you're sleeping. There's no easier way to say that. Things like your decision making, error checking, and critical thinking are all inhibited, making these errors possible. The specific area that's likely involved is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. In fact, while some lesions in the parental cortex stop dreaming, lesions in this area in particular have no effect. In producing dreams, I mean. Uh, you're definitely going to notice if you're missing this part of your brain during the day. But these lesion studies, along with further EEG work, suggest that the DLPFC is definitely inhibited. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is crucial in decision making, future planning, and probably extends much further. On top of this, you can probably count on a bunch of areas like the anterior cingulate cortex or the basal forebrain being inhibited too. Inhibition of these areas help play into the disorientated quality of dreams, or basically your inability to identify things as being wrong. It's a lot harder to translate this aspect of dreaming into a gameplay experience. As a player, you're completely coherent. You have all your executive functions intact, you aren't disorientated and impaired as you are when you're dreaming. So if you're trying to make a dreamlike experience, what do you do? 
You can't instill these neural changes into a person. If you try and make things disorientating and confusing, you're more likely to end up frustrating people than giving them good experience, since they're still coming at this coherently, like I'm sure the LSD game did for a lot of people. You need a balance between coherency and having that strange, incoherent aspect of a dream. And that's something that Dreaming Sarah achieves. Its world is grounded on rules that you can understand, and while how it's organized doesn't make any sense, it isn't frustrating and disorientating to play. And I think this is a much better approach to making dreaming games. Though, there's still a piece of information we're missing about dreams that we need to better understand this, to better understand Sarah's experience. So let's finish off by talking about lucid dreaming. This is a state where the dreamer has conscious control over their dream. They aren't awake, but they retain certain cognitive abilities and can manipulate the dreams to their liking. For some people, this comes naturally, but most of us find it difficult to achieve. It is something you can train yourself to do though. Not so sure you need those sleep masks. Based on EEG studies, we can see that a lot of the prefrontal areas that are usually shut off are turned on during lucid dreaming. What this means for your dream experience is that you retain a lot of those higher order functions, decision making, error checking, critical thinking, at least to some extent. And I think your experience of a dream is a lot more coherent too. You're able to act by your own will rather than having a more passive role. Now, in the context of a video game, you're usually not in a passive role, you're actively participating. You choose where to run, where to go, when to jump. While you don't have complete control of the world you're in, I'd argue that when you make a video game based on dreaming, you're really making a video game based on lucid dreaming. And to capture that experience, having coherency in the game makes sense. What I mean is, it's not like Sarah would be running around confused and disorientated like she was having a regular dream. She's self-aware like the player is, and I think the fact that we can draw this connection between ourselves and the character while playing is really, really cool. Okay, that was a lot, maybe too much, but I just find all this stuff so cool. I really wanted to share what makes Dreaming Sarah so special to me, because it's really unique to find a game that captures all these different aspects of dreaming in such an innocent package. Yeah, I'm just here for the science. I don't even know what we're doing here. We're, we're recording a video for Dreaming Sarah, the game I've been talking about for months. Uh, I tried to get you to play it, the pixel platformer. Yeah, whatever. Just, just call me if you need me. Better not go back to sleep.